Good afternoon and welcome to this BMA Law webinar on top tips for buying and selling property. <laughs> I am Linda Kirk, a solicitor and director with Adkirk Law, and we have been asked to present the webinar for B on behalf of BMA Law. I have pra practiced conveyancing for in excess of 30 years, and I've worked for high street firms through to large corporate firms heading up property teams across the country and I have experienced firsthand the challenges clients face when buying and selling property. In 2019, I set up Adkirk Law with my colleague Rachel Adamson with the ambition and passion to provide our clients with a personal bespoke legal service where communication is key and they can speak with their solicitor directly at any time during the process to help reduce the stress and issues clients often face. What you will learn today, we will discuss the key components of the conveyancing process. We will look at who is involved and what their role is. We will also look at what you can and should do to prepare and what you will need to assist the process. <clears throat> the key components of the conveyancing process are preparation, making sure you have the right information, the paperwork, you will need to complete a number of forms, the financial elements of the transaction, the conveyancing process itself, including the contracts and documents that you will be entering into and finally completion of the transaction itself. The most common question we are asked is how long will it take? In short the answer to this is the transaction will only move as fast as the slowest person in the chain. We generally advise 10 to 12 weeks on average. It could be quicker or it could take longer, depending on the type of property. For example, freehold houses move quickly and leasehold properties take much longer. The reason for this is we require more information from the management company and freeholder, and this can add time to the length of the transaction. Also, the chain, the length of the chain can determine how long the matter will take. The more people in the chain, the more longer the transaction will take. Providing information promptly and by return can save weeks. Who is involved and what is their role? The first person you would deal with is the estate agent. They market the property, arrange viewings, accept offers and will negotiate on your behalf. One important point I would make is you should, when buying, always make an appointment to visit the property as close to completion as possible to make sure the property is in the same state and condition as when you first viewed it. The mortgage advisor will arrange your mortgage and advise on the best product for you. They will require your financial information proof of income, bank statements, proof of your deposit and how you have acquired the monies to purchase the property. Once they have collated all this information, they will submit your mortgage application for you. Once approved, the lender will carry out a survey. This is not a full survey and is merely a valuation of the property. You should ask your mortgage advisor if you are able to upgrow upgrade the valuation to a full survey. Uh, generally, it is a home buyer's survey report that is requested and this will save you paying for the bank survey and then organising your own survey. A RICS qualified surveyor will advise you on the appropriate type of survey for you. As I have previously said, a home buyer's is normally the one recommended. The survey will reveal any issues 
it will also detail the works that are required immediately to the property and works that are required in the near future. It may also recommend you obtain certain reports such as drainage reports, electrical reports or gas reports. You must always obtain the reports recommended in your survey and then obtain quotes for the works to be carried out. This will then enable you to understand exactly what the cost is of the works that will be required to the property. And then you may wish to consider renegotiating the property, uh, renegotiating the purchase price. You would do this through the estate agent. Each party will have their own solicitor to act for them. The same firm should not represent both parties. What can and should you do to prepare? Preparation is very important. When selling, gather together all relevant documents. For example, documents you received when you purchased the property, any old title deeds you were given, any warranties, guarantees, gas and electrical certificates, planning permissions, building regulation completion certificates. If you are selling a relatively new property, the information you got when purchasing is useful and will save the solicitor time in getting copies of planning documents, road adoption agreements, etc., which can take time to obtain. If you are selling as an executor, we will need the grant of probate and death certificate. If you have changed your name since you purchased the property, we will need evidence of the change of name. For example, your marriage certificate or a deed of change of name. When buying, make your solicitor aware of any important facts, such as any extensions, boundary quirks or issues. If there are any right of way issues, say for example, you need to access the property over someone else's land, let your solicitor know so they can check at the outset there are no issues. Sometimes there are access issues. Anything that you feel may be an issue, let your solicitor know. It is also helpful for the solicitors to be aware of any personal factors, i.e. forthcoming holidays, Specific time constraints, dates you cannot move, your preferred method of communication. Most titles today are registered, so we will simply download the electronic title from the land registry to enable us to issue the contract. However, if the property is unregistered, we would require the original title deeds before we, were, we are able to request the issue the contract. What can and should you do to prepare? With leasehold properties, a seller's pack is required from the management company and sometimes also the freeholder. This pack will contain very important information, for example, the last three years accounts, the service charge statement and ground rent statement, the insurance schedule for the building, details of any major forthcoming works, whether or not there is a sinking fund for major works. The pack is obtained by the seller and the management company on freeholder will charge a fee for obtaining this. Generally, it ranges between 150 to 450 pounds. It is important that this pack is obtained as early as possible and you should speak to your solicitor about this when selling a property. What can you do to prepare? <clears throat> when selling, we will need your bank statement for the account where you wish the net proceeds of sale to be sent. For security reasons, we need to see the account registered in your name and to your address before we will release the monies to you. Providing this at the outset is helpful and saves time at the last minute on completion. If you own the joint the property jointly, then we would need a joint account bank statement or 
confirmation from the other party that they are happy for the monies to go into your sole name. When buying, we will need your source of funds. We will need to understand how you have acquired the monies to purchase the property. During this process, we have to have a full audit trail. We will start by asking you for six months bank statements for your current account and also for your savings account. However, if you have monies in other accounts, we will need the same number of statements for all accounts where the monies are held. If, for example, you have sold a property and you, you are using the net proceeds of sale to fund this purchase, we need evidence of that sale. So we would need the completion statement from when you sold the property and your bank statement showing that credit in the account. If you've inherited monies, we would ask for evidence of the inheritance. So a letter from the solicitor confirming your in inheritance. Sometimes it may be that you've sold an asset like a car to fund the purchase and we would need some sort of documentary evidence to support that. The source of funding is really difficult for us to um, do and it's so important that you provide this information as early as possible in the process so we can raise any questions we may have on the documentation provided. If there are large payments crediting your account, we will ask where those payments are from and we will also ask you to evidence those payments so it can become quite complex. What can and should you do to prepare? With identification, we will need to see your passport and driving license and a utility bill, which is no more than six months old. We will provide you with an electronic link for you to actually upload this information. It's a relatively simple process and you can do it from either your mobile phone or from your desktop computer. So if you have ready your passport and your utility bill, which is no more than three months old, and also your bank statements, you can actually go into Open Banking and upload your bank statements for your source of funds. The documents are held in a secure portal and nobody has access to that portal other than our firm. Please ensure that you complete all documentation as quickly as possible. There are lots of forms to go through, especially when selling property. It is important that you read through the forms carefully, fill out every single question. If you do not answer every single question, then you will have inquiries raised by the buyer's solicitor asking you to answer these questions and it can cause a delay. You also need to gather together all the information that's referred to in the property information form and ensure that you submit that with the completed form. We generally allow you to complete the forms electronically. Sometimes people prefer that they are posted out to them, which is not a problem. We can send out the forms for you to complete by hand and then you can scan or post them back to us. It, the information on those forms also has to be accurate. You must not tell any lies on the forms because you could face an action for misrepresentation. If you've received notices about next door's planning permission, then you must enclose those notices. Why are Kirk Law Conveyancing? <clears throat> We are for all BMA law members a special premium service at a special rate. We offer a no obligation fixed fee quote free of charge and use the latest technology to try and speed up the process. We provide you with direct contact details, for example, a mobile telephone number so that you can ring and speak to your solicitor at any time during the transaction. We also will arrange out of office, office appointments, so if it's easier to speak to your solicitor in the evening or at weekend, we are more than happy to accommodate this. 
we have special rates for first time buyers. All of our staff are qualified and all of our solicitors are very experienced in all areas of conveyancing. We can deal with the purchase and sale of properties, transfers of equity, remortgages, title splits, for example, splitting a house into flats, deeds of variations, lease extensions, and any kind of non-conventional conveyancing. You can visit the BMA Law website for more information and you can obtain a quotation from the website. That concludes the webinar. Do you have any questions? I can see that some questions are coming through now, so I will um, somebody has asked about showing your pay slips, savings, etc., even before I go for a viewing. Is that right? No. The estate agents will ask you to prove that you can afford to buy the property. So they will want to see a bank account statement showing the deposit and they will ask you for an agreement in principle from your mortgage lender. Um, and then, of course, once you instruct us to deal with the transaction, we will then ask you to provide your payslip, etc., and upload it to our portal. Um, the second question, if you have more than one bank account, did you say bank statements are needed for every single account? Yes, bank statements are needed for every single account. We have to have a full audit trail for all the monies. And we need to understand how you've acquired the monies, um, i.e. from savings, sale of a property, etc. What is the tax position when selling your first home? If your first home is your main residence, there really is no tax implications. Um, there, are, there is no capital gains tax to pay on your main residence. If you buy a new house and the current house is still on sale, do you pay stamp duty? Yes. So if you purchase a new property and you haven't sold your existing property, i.e. your main residence, you will pay the higher rate stamp duty. My solicitor has asked for three years bank statements. The starting point with the source of funds is six months bank statements for our firm. Every firm has different requirements. So it depends on what information you provide as to whether or not they will ask for further information. <clears throat> How high is the capital gains tax now? Um, solicitors are not tax experts, so we would advise you to speak to your accountant or a accountant about capital gains tax. Can you be a bit more spe specific in how you charge for your services? It very much depends on the type of property, whether or not, you're not, or not you're getting a mortgage as to what the fees will be. But the quote calculator on the website will ask you the appropriate questions and pro provided you provide the correct information, you will receive an accurate quote. Alternatively, you can ring the office and we will arrange for a quote to be sent to you. If I was given the money by my brother, what kind of evidence do I need to provide? So basically, if you receive a gift from a relative, 
um, we will need to obtain the identification and bank statements for the relative in the same way as we obtain your information. So they will have to provide an audit trail for the monies and confirm how they've acquired the monies, i.e. from savings uh, or from the sale of a property, etc. An estate agent insisted I see their mortgage advisor who, who insisted I have to show my pay slips, savings, etc. even before I go for a viewing. Is that right? Some estate agents do insist on you providing this information before they will allow you to view a property simply because they do not want to people to go who are not qualified financially to buy the property. Um, most estate agents will only ask for this information at the point when you make the offer to purchase the property. You are quite within your rights to have your own mortgage advisor. You don't have to go with the estate agent's mortgage advisor or mortgage broker. Can you explain how to execute help to buy ISAs? Basically, if you have a help to buy ISA, once you are ready to proceed with the purchase of the property, we would ask you to go to the bank and arrange for the ISA to be closed. At that point, the bank will issue you with a closing statement, and that closing statement will then need to be sent to us and we will then upload that to the website and request the, the bonus to fund the uh, purchase of the property. There are limits on the purchase price. So you do need to check that the property you're purchasing does not exceed the, the limit that you are allowed to um, obtain the bonus for. Is there any tax implications on using gifted money from spouse to buy a buy to rent? Um, as I said before, we're not tax experts. As far as I'm aware, there are no tax implement implications, but you would need to speak to an accountant to discuss the best way to do this. You also need to make sure that at the point you obtain a mortgage that you disclose you're receiving a gift. Some buy to let mortgage lenders do not like gifted money. If you live in rented accommodation and I have another property in the UK, do you have to pay higher SDLT if we buy a new, if we buy now a house as a main residence? Sadly, you do have to pay the higher rate if you already own a property. How far back might you be expected to go for previous house sales to prove origin of funds for purchase? There is no time limit and it will depend on um, how long the monies have been in your account. Uh, we would always ask for evidence of the house sale. So a copy of the completion statement and just the um, statement showing the money's credit in your account. If I inherit money from a parental property from home country, how do I disclose that? It will be necessary for you to provide the documentation from that inheritance. Obviously, if it comes from um, a country, another country, then it may be necessary to get that interpreted so that we can see exactly um, what the documentation says, but you will still have to disclose it 
in the same way um, as you do the other sorts of funds. Are there any conditions where we don't have to pay stamp duty on an additional property? There are some exemptions. Um, the one, the main one really is if the property is uninhabitable, you can um, apply to be uh, exempt from the stamp duty. My brother and I are inheriting my dad's house and we are waiting for a grant of probate. My brother wants to buy my share of the house. Do we need to wait until the grant of probate before we can do this? Yes, you do. Because the grant of probate is the authority to actually deal with the property transaction. So without, without the grant of probate, um, the executors don't have the authority to transfer the property. Is stamp duty the same if you buy main residence as my own company as opposed to my name? If you purchase the property in a company name, you always pay the higher rate. So you would have to pay the higher rent, even though it was your main residence. Will this seminar be repeated as I have missed the first 17 minutes? The webinar, I believe, has been uh, recorded, so it will be available to all the members who have not been able to join. How do we apply for exemption for stamp duty? Your solicitor will deal with that, this for you at the time of completion of the purchase. And the last question on the chat is, I think my second question has not been answered. Sorry, could you repeat that question? I just can't see the second question. I'm not sure which one you asked, Linda, but there is, um, what is the tax position when selling your first home was the first question. And the second question Sorry, is... Sorry, can you repeat that? Sorry, the second question is... Um, if you buy another house after selling the first home, when does that become tax exempt? If you buy, sorry, I'm, I'm struggling to hear you. If you buy a second a property, when does that become tax exempt? So the stamp duty, if you, you already own a property and you sell your main residence and buy a new residence, then you just pay the normal stamp duty rate. So it would depend on the purchase price of the property as to whether or not stamp duty is payable. Can we sell part of the garden to, say, a neighbour as part of a deed splitting and how easy or difficult is it to do this? 
Um, yes, you can if there are no restrictive covenants preventing you from doing this on the title. It is relatively easy to do that, but if you have a mortgage on the property, you will need the consent of your lender to release that piece of land from your legal charge. When you say all bank accounts, do you mean the accounts relating to the money, not the ones that have no relevance? Yes, we do mean the accounts where the monies are held. We do not require to see accounts that have no relevance. Is it advisable to use a private limited company to buy a second property? There are certainly benefits uh, to purchasing a property in a limited company name as to your individual name. I would advise you to speak to your accountant to understand what is the best way for you personally to do this as they will be qualified to advise you on the tax position. What I would say is if you obtain a mortgage to purchase the property in your limited company name, you will be asked to guarantee that mortgage as a director of the company. If you move house and buy a new home, how long do you have to live in for capital gains tax exemption? There is no capital gains tax payable on your main residence. If you move into a buy to let property and then uh, use that as your main residence, the, the period I believe is six months. But again, I'm not a tax expert and I would ask you to check with your accountant. I think I've dealt with all the questions. If I haven't dealt with any questions, then um, I'm more than happy to um, reply by email after the seminar. I'm also more than happy if anybody would like to contact me by email with any further questions that you have, um, and I will deal with them by email. Thank you. That concludes the webinar.